Hello and welcome, I'm Dennis Mabuka and in this video we're going to be looking at something that uh, I've been having a lot of fun with in the past few months and I've grown to love it almost as much as I love 3D and uh, that's the world of vector art and more specifically uh, the SVG vector format because one, that's what Blender allows us to import into it and two, it's just a really cool format with what it can do um, on the browser. So the distinguishing difference between a vector image and a raster image is that um, while a raster image is made up of tiny individual pixels that form up the whole, collectively form up the whole image, vector uh, images are drawn by shapes defined by math and the SVG vector format specifically was designed was created for the web so to really see where uh, svg shines when its true potential is tapped into um, you'll see that on on the browser and the people who are already taking advantage of this and making really really cool websites and i'll leave a link to some of my favorites in in the description and if if, if you actually look at the SVG um, code, um, it actually looks very similar to um, HTML if you're familiar with what that looks like. And when the browser has access to all these values that actually draw the, the artwork, uh, it gives uh, just some new levels of interactivity that were previously not possible with uh, regular raster images. Um, but since we won't be dealing with uh, the web or the browser, um, we'll be using uh, the SVG inside Blender. And I wanted to use it in most of the time when I'm, I'm bringing an SVG into Blender, it's when I'm converting the occasional 2D logo into a 3D logo for animation and stuff like that. But I wanted to do something that, that was just a bit more than that and try to see what's possible with this now the good thing about this is you don't really have to be really good at drawing to do this kind of thing as you can see um i'm working in inkscape i'm working from a reference photo and what i try what i try to do is get as much as i can from the photo while leaving myself room for creative freedom and trying out stuff um, as i go along and keep what works and drop what doesn't and uh, what I'm trying to do is trace out the outline, the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights from the photo. And then from there, I can try and be creative with other aspects of the image. Now, that's also just a preference. You don't have to do it exactly like that. Um, sometimes I just do the outlines and the shadows, and that end, ends up working uh, quite well also. And this is actually the part of the process that may uh, take a bit of time, but uh, it actually does pay off if you put in the work and can be very rewarding uh, when you're done. And this is just a personal preference, uh, but I try not to have any carved lines in my artwork. I think that's what gives it that kind of anime looking style, which I really like. But that's just a personal preference. You don't have to do the same. Now, you may ask why not just use grease pencil for this kind of thing, um, but just from trial and error, um, I, I draw using my mouse, I don't have a tablet, and I find it much more comfortable to use the mouse on Inkscape than a grease pencil. And uh, while this sort of thing obviously has its limitations, for example, uh, if you wanted to animate the character, this wouldn't be the best way to go about it. but um, it can give you just cool looking results. For example, if you wanted to make like a visualization for music, this is a nice way to get something to create like a seamlessly looping animation that actually looks really nice and, and works. So this is pretty much the same process that I went through for all these other examples. And when I was done, uh, this is, this is what I had from Inkscape. With that done, we've pretty much done almost all the work, or well, most of the work. 
So I'll import this uh, SVG into Blender and I'll scale it up and you'll immediately notice that one of the limitations is that we will be limited to only one perspective of this whole thing and that's directly from the front of the artwork. If you try to pan around the SVG object, it will break that illusion because it will be obvious uh, that it's a flat 2D surface in a 3D space. And then sometimes you might, after importing your SVG, you might need to uh, do a bit of cleaning up. For example, if you look at the hair, in Inkscape it's made of lots of tiny parts that Inkscape can handle really well, but when you import them over into Blender, when they're being turned into Blender's curves, some issues may arise. For example, you can see that the hair here looks hollow. So what I'll do to fix that, I'll just try and select the one continuous uh, loop curve that forms the hair and then invert that selection and delete all the extra curves and that instantly fixes uh, the problem. Now this can be a problem um, if you're not, if you don't keep that in mind while you're creating your curves in whichever software you're using. Mm, but if you're careful, you, you will save yourself a lot of time uh, later on when you bring them over into Blender. But more and more with the new releases of Blender, I've found that I've had to uh, make less and less of these tiny little corrections. Now next we'll set up the lighting which is really simple. It's just, uh, most of the lighting is done by the by a HDRI which you can get from HDRI Haven. Also when you're creating your lighting, be considerate of the direction of the lighting in the original photo that you used and try to mimic that in your render. And also you can also add a lamp to also try and kind of mimic the direction of the lighting um, from the photo. Uh, now that we have our character uh, settled inside Blender and uh, well lit, we want to give this thing uh, a little bit of life. And what I did for this one, I have in the background uh, a plane. And it's just a simple plane that's emitting a particle system. And the particle system uh, is uh, a collection of these three leaves which are being emitted by this plane way off in the background just slightly off the uh, view of the camera and then I have uh, a, a force field, a wind, which is blowing the particles towards the the foreground, towards our character in the foreground and that's that's just it for for the leaves Now lastly for the chain, um, I, I added a curve and then at the center, at the origin of that curve, um, I, I add a torus and then just model a small piece of the chain, just a few sections of the chain. And then I'll use an array modifier to, um, to extend that chain to whatever length that I want. And it's important here that the the model of the chain and the curve uh, share the same, their origins share the same point in space. Um, it will save you a lot of trouble from trying to align uh, the chain and the curve. So after I've modeled my chain and added the array modifier, then add a curve modifier on top of that, which will cause that uh, chain to follow the path of the circle and then using the array modifier you can lengthen the length of the chain to uh, whatever suits your needs and then from there if you just animate the x axis the position of the chain on the x axis and if you even drag it just along the x axis you'll see how it follows along the path of the circle and then that's you can use that to animate the rotation of the chain along the path. Then you can select uh, the pair of curve and the model of the chain and duplicate it. Now select one curve and if you go into edit mode and scale it up a bit you'll see that it scales up along with its uh, companion chain and then in under the animation settings you can just tweak it and just uh, change the direction of the movement and that simply you have uh, 
a duplicated uh, chain that revolves in the opposite direction. And that's pretty much uh, it. If you go into edit mode, uh, into the curves edit mode and tweak your curves, the chains uh, will follow along nicely. Uh, if you like the video, don't forget to feed the algorithm and also subscribe for more awesome stuff in the future. Oh.